This is Entropy to Work Podcast. My name is Thiago Ebel and I am your host. So today's episode, we're doing something slightly different. Actually, it was my idea since the beginning to eventually have some episodes like this, but this is, this is going to be the first one. Basically, uh, long story short, I have a paper to have been accepted for the ASME 2021 Turbo Expo. Uh, if you are in the turbo machining world, this is the biggest conference where everyone in turbo machinery, the OEMs, everybody's there. And uh, yeah, it's such an honor to have actually a, a peer-reviewed paper accepted there. And in today's episode, I am I'm having an informal discussion of why and how we did it, uh, the things that we did in this paper, with the other co-authors. So in today. Today's episode, I'm talking with Mark Anderson, the CTO of Concepts and REC, Bart Pandia, a senior application engineer at Ricardo Software, and Matt Perchanok, principal software engineer at Ricardo Software. The name of our paper is Use of an Integrated Approach for Analysis and Design of Turbocharged Internal Combustion Engines. Long name, I know, but long story short, um, it's basically for the design and analysis of turbocharged engines. And that was not any easier. Anyway, usually if you're not in this automotive industry of you have not been in touch, basically a way of making your internal combustion engine, like the ones that you see in trucks, in, uh, out, uh, in cars, etc., you can increase the power torque and most of the times also the efficiency by increasing the inlet pressure of your engine. And the main technology used nowadays is a turbocharger. Basically, we have a turbine driving uh, in the exhaust uh, from the exhaust gases, actually is gathering the energy from the exhaust gases and driving a compressor and this compressor compresses the ambient air uh, and pressurizes it to the engine. And uh, it's a very iterative design. It's actually pretty complex, even though turbo machine, uh, turbo charging is not something new, uh, but it's still a quite complex process. And nonetheless, that actually we have engine original equipment manufacturers or OEMs, we have engine manufacturers and we have turbocharger manufacturers because the, the the amount of research and technology necessary to design and manufacture these two tools are, uh, are really complex even though they work together. So what we try to do here is kind of try to bridge this word and come up with a methodology of how to you know use different tools um, to auxiliate in the analysis if your turbocharger matches your engine, if the turbine matches the compressor and etc. Uh, I guess we discuss more details during uh, the podcast and uh, I don't know, not sure if it's too technical. You guys let me know. I liked very much, of course, I wrote the paper with these guys and it was a, a pleasure to catch up with them after so long. It was a pretty interesting example, a couple of examples, of course, the the, the the, the review that we did it and then the, the two examples, the, the case studies that we run together. And that's about it. So now I'll bring you Mark, Bart, and Matt. So yeah, first of all, thank you very much. It's very good to finally coordinate this with you guys. So glad to be here. <laughs> first things first, our paper have been accepted, and uh, I just re I thought I had a little bit more time as usual, but I have up until Tuesday to um, record a video. You you did that last year, Mark? How was that? You send a video, and then later they tell you if you are uh, if you have a thirty minute slot or a ten minute slot. I've never done the video thing before. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, last year I. I uh, listened into a lot of videos, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice because um, you've all been in a situation where you know, you're in there for half an hour and you're five minutes in and, oh man, I'm stuck. <laughs> 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 five, 
<laughs> yeah, just five minutes. And already, I know I've wasted half an hour, and it's, it's bad form. Of course, to walk out in, in that mm -hmm. session, so you can. But there's no problem just to hit the fast forward button and, and <laughs> <laughs> recording. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Apparently, next week they let us know if we have a 10 minute slot or a 30 minute slot. So uh, yeah, let's see. I'm not sure. Part and Matt, I was not sure if you guys had access to the comments on the on the paper, on the I mean the reviewers' comments. I never saw them. Yeah, it's a, it's really interesting. I mean, first of all, the first reviewers round that we had there was four, which for this round I thought was unusual. Usually just two, but uh, and I found really funny because one of them was butchering a little bit like oh i don't think there is details enough about the 1d simulation there is not details enough about the mean line what you use there and blah blah it's like mm, okay and then the fourth reviewer was actually saying there was too much information probably someone coming for this conference already knew enough about mainline modeling and 1d so i should go straight to the point i was like okay i'm not i don't know how to coordinate here one thing and Mark, you also read that. I, I, I guess something that kind of came to my mind also is that uh, I'm not sure if some people actually got the main idea. The main idea was not really, you know, the SAE maps, how we communicate between back and forth. It's more like how we use this two things in parallel. So, okay. Yeah. There's people yeah. don't know what we're talking about. So let's talk about the paper. So our name is use of an integrated approach for analysis and design of turbocharger internal combustion engine so long story short and you guys correct me if i'm wrong i guess mark and i have been working on the turbo machinery side designing compressors turbines etc in that word usually what we think is about the component in itself we want to expand the range of operation for the same speed line and stuff like that and it Almost is someone giving us the boundary conditions, and we design a turbo machinery piece for that. Now, for you guys, Matt and Part, and correct me if I'm wrong, usually have the engine designer, and he assumes he's gonna have a boosting pressure available to increase power, and basically he goes off the shelf for whatever OEMs of turbo machinery give to them, and if they don't have something, they basically scale that up and down not necessarily that scale is uh, physically right. Is that correct? That's a good way of describing? <laughs> you know, I don't usually do the design myself, but... I, I think a lot of providers have a you know, whole family of different uh, designs that can be uh, you know, scaled and so on or, or trimmed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's, a, that's probably what they do a lot of the time, yes. Yeah, and, and talking with past customers and people in the industry, it's uh, I found it interesting because I, I'm mentioning this because one of the reviewers, he was just like, I'm not sure where the novelty here is. Uh, I think the paper is not very much used for research engineers, but might be useful for applications, you know, engineers on the field and designers. I was like, well, that's exactly who we had in mind. Because <laughs> yeah. I think. Probably for someone doing a PhD, maybe you know, researching about novel kinds of internal combustion engine, this is actually not in use. But also, you kind of have the time and the resources to go through these different models and things like that. And it's not a common practice in the in the industry at all. So you guys from your end for the engines and us from our end working with a lot of turbo machinery de uh, developers. Yeah, it's not the case. Usually, like it's two different conversations, and it's kind of a miracle that in the end it kind of matches. <laughs> well, I, I think, I think, in fact, you know, the the, the the engine designer does have a conversation with the turbo supplier. It's not exactly that, but yeah, I, you know, I think it's a it's a there's a wonderful potential to be able to use the two codes together because you know it it get, it allows the uh, engine developer to to do what ifs and and uh, to to try and design the turbo to, to suit their needs. Yeah, at least gives a very good idea before actually, you know, putting a lot of money into a test rig and putting all this stuff. Probably, of course, this is, 
ultimately what you always need to do to necessarily see if you're going to the right direction. But the problem is when you're getting started, you, you're looking for a turbo charger that actually doesn't exist. So you do a scale and non necessarily that scale is physical. So maybe you're driving your compressor and when you ask the OEM of the turbo charger, actually there's no compressor, it's completely choked at that point. You, you cannot actually deliver that flow rate. So, you know, your whole performance goes down. So, yeah, I think it's a, a function of, you know, is it to their economic advantage or not, right? If, if you want to say, go to a turbocharger supplier, say, hey, we want to, we want to test this kind of turbocharger. Will you make us one? They'd probably tell you to get lost. But if uh, you wanted a million for a new fleet of vehicles, I'm sure they'd uh, pull the stops out for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. one. And then, yeah. uh, I've seen it. You know, I've seen both extremes where with the turbocharger talking to engine people is just man, it's just something to bolt on the side and forget about. But um, but I've also been very surprised how deep a lot of uh, OEMs really want to go and really understand the turbocharger, and uh, partly because they're they're doing innovative things to try to combine the two systems together, right? And, and partly because they want leverage when they deal with their turbocharger suppliers. You know what what you know. Can I go and ask for five percent more efficiency? Mm, no, probably not. You know, can you can you ask for a tenth of a percent? Mm, yeah, maybe. Can you can you mm -hmm. can you you know can they provide this or that? If you don't know, then you're kind of at the mercy of just what they tell you. So it's not uncommon for a lot of these engine people to have some you know really bona fide experts on the staff mm -hmm. to uh, you know work on things like integration, but also just to improve their negotiation position with the, the suppliers yeah. and also a movement that we start seeing at least a couple of people that we cannot i think mention names at this point but engine manufacturers starting to bring that research uh knowledge inside in-house so basically maybe not yet but definitely for the next couple of years they want to start developing their own tuba chargers so and the whole and the whole process from the sketch of an engine all the way to actually delivering it is that it's it's now in house. So it's not like, hey, I'm going to this and that supplier. Let's test if they have some turbochargers that are that match my engine. It's like, no, let's kind of do them in parallel, and then we test it, and then go back, and everything is in house. So that's basically what they did back in the Second World War, right? They had everything in house. They're just testing, just because like you need answers, you need a new engine. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, only now we're basically picking up to that. <laughs> I've seen the uh, some of the engine people get you know pretty deep into it, but uh, don't often get the sense they want to take over that business directly. You know that they want to get into the turbocharger manufacturing. Um, they do want to, uh, you know, they do want to understand it to it to a large degree. Mm -hmm. They want to work with their suppliers to uh, you know, integrate it better. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. So uh so Ben, what are we doing here? Uh we have in the call Matt in Parth. They're from Ricardo Software. Basically, Ricardo has a 1D software that is very common for these OEMs of engines. So Matt, Parth, you guys want to doesn't need to be the full pitch, but you guys can definitely explain to me much better what is a 1D solver and how it is used. Uh, well, if you think about an if you think about an engine, you know it consists of a cylinder and a piston and other elements, and then uh, ductwork which connects them all. So, you know, you could if you wanted to make a full blown 3D CFD simulation of the whole thing, you would have one huge complicated model, which would take a long time to build and take forever to run. And maybe it wouldn't even be that easy to interpret what's going on, interpret the results. So a 1D CFD code like WAVE is a code where uh, we made some approximations where it's a bunch of dots which are modeled as being 1D flow and junctions which connect them together. And then the cylinders and pistons and other elements like turbochargers, which are all bolted together. So the, the whole idea of it is it's a very uh, 
practical way that you can build a model of your engine, you can calibrate it, and you can get decent predictions of the engine behavior with it. And then with that, uh, you can see what happens when you make modifications to your design, see how that changes the performance, or try and improve your design to meet whatever performance targets you have. Yeah, there's a perfect definition. In a nutshell, yeah. is what it is. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess nowadays, because the computational power is so big, people always think as CFD as a concept that is interchangeable with design. But it's, a, and sometimes, especially, let's say, the people who are not designing it, the people who are making the managers, they, they might have that feeling. But it's, it's funny when, Sometimes I, I see the, the the look in some people's faces and say, CFD is not a design tool. It is an analysis tool. You need to yeah. you need to already have a geometry to run that. And even to run the CFD, you need to have a pretty good idea where are the overall conditions or your boundary conditions, even to be able to run. So it's 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 funny how more and more is becoming just like, oh, I'm just gonna run CFD and design an engine. No, it's that's not like that's not like it is done. Actually, very likely what Matt is just describing here is the perfect tool to actually do an early design. So you can decide how many cylinders, if it's gonna be one liter engine or 1.5 liter engine, or if for the same one liter you might want to increase power torque, like we did in this power. So for that you need some extra uh uh, pressure in the inlet of the engine. So that's the perfect tool to do that, right? Yeah, I mean, a good example of it is uh, something a lot more subtle, but it's just uh, turbocharger balancing and developing the control system, you know, the control strategy for the turbocharger and the fueling and all that, the rest of the engine. It's actually a pretty complicated business. And a lot of the people, you know, there's a lot of people who are real experts who are using our tools to, to do just that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can imagine. You guys don't have like a specific tool that is uh, uh, that is like wave live or something like that. That is, you kind of calibrate with the real engine and it runs with the engine or something like that. I'm not sure I fully understand what that uh, is. We do have some different tools. One is wave, which is, you know, uh, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but a traditional. CFD code, though a 1D CFD code. We also have a real-time code. That might be what you're getting at. Mm. You know, the the real-time code is a is kind of a somewhat slightly uh, simplified. Oh, dog just came into the room, just barking. It's a <laughs> it's kind of a uh, it's a model that can run a lot faster. It has all the networks, flow networks, and stuff that are in wave, but it can actually run in real time. And what you can do with it is uh, you can do a you can use it in a hill system. I'm not an expert in hill system, so I might have a few details wrong here. But basically, the idea is you have a, a special computer that you run this simulation that you run this code in, and then you can connect the ECU of your uh, car or whatever to, and it thinks it's an engine. So huh. if you're running that in the ECU, if you're running, you know, a, a simulation code in the hill system. You can you can you can use it to to develop the uh, control program for the engine. Mm -hmm. which is, other things are just that it's very fast and people use it in Simulink and other tools just mm -hmm. as a way of uh, mostly this from what I understand just developing the control systems for their engines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it uh, almost sounds like using a surrogate of the engine to develop the the control systems. Yeah, that's exactly what it is in a hill system. But I, I think there's a lot of a lot of work is just done in uh, in like tools like Simulink, where it's just they just use it mainly, I believe, just because it's fast or very fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And Mark, in our end, that's exactly the, the same level of design and analysis that we have in the mean lines, right? Where we treat the turbo machinery that is usually something very complex, and there is a lot of transient thing play into play, but in order to really design something to know if it's going to be two inches or five inches, we first treat as a control volume. So 
it doesn't matter what actually is between inlet and exit. We just treat everything as a control volume. And based on that, we calculate RPMs, inlet areas, exit areas, angles. Is that correct? That's a good definition on the line? Yeah, and it's kind of similar to what, what Matt described. Um, yeah, basically, we, had, we offer a hierarchy of, of models and um, the geometric modeling parameterization. And it's all about getting the best possible design and the finite time and budget that you have. Not necessarily the ultimate answer, um, especially if you know it's so time to me you can only get one. So uh, usually it's a very common thing in engineering. You, you bring in a hierarchy of analysis approach. You run a lot of the cheap stuff when you're just trying to search for space, and then you kind of move up to the progressively more expensive, time-consuming, and hopefully you you can uh, you know eliminate the the unworthy candidates early on with the cheap stuff and then you know, apply your extra firepower to the um, you know more promising designs. So mm -hmm. you kind of move up that hierarchy in turbo machinery from mean line to streamline curvature, CFD, and then there's levels you know beyond that, you know, in CFD and so on. Mm -hmm. So all about getting the best best design you can with the, the time and, and budget you have. Yeah. And something that is right for both ideas for the one dcfd and for the mean line design in total machinery is that it relies a lot of empirical data so some empirical and some semi-empirical so models are not fully empirical but we have a bunch of data and then we kind of feed a model in between and just like yeah it kind of behaves like that when it's a machine this size or is a valve this size we can pretty much predict what is pressure versus flow based on this and uh off we go right yeah, there's uh, obviously the lower the, the modeling level, the more empiricism there is. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, the CFD, there's still some empiricism even in CFD in that coefficients on the turbulence model and so on, yeah. Yeah. But, but it's less. So um, and then you can use the higher order methods to kind of tune up the lower order methods. You, know, you can find your CFD, spend a few hours doing that, and then take that and calibrate your mean line with that and then Run your whole map in a minute, whereas you know, running a map in CFD can can take you quite a while. Mm -hmm. Part of the art, is knowing where I guess in any engineering, part of the art is knowing what the error bar is on your analysis and when it's time to kind of move up the food chain and uh, you know apply a more rigorous method. Yeah, what's a little bit different about uh, about an engine simulation is that you know typically. I think when most model when most people are modeling an engine, they'll model the engine with wave or something similar to with wave or one d c f d code, but there isn't they don't really use a higher order method for the whole thing, but they'll use higher order methods for bits and pieces of it. You know we have a full blown three f d c f d three d c f d code which people use to look at usually in cylinder flows and Again, I'm not an expert on everything about, about Vectis or 3D CFD code, but I think you can also focus on different, you know, different parts of the flow path and model it in more detail. But usually it's just focusing in on details like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I that valve it, design and valve timing, right? Yeah. And I think a trend is that, you know, when people who are designing vehicles, they have, um, they have a, Kind of an overall simulation where they they have it running as co-simulations, little bits and pieces that model all the different systems that they mm -hmm. need to that they need to care about. And then there's hierarchies of models for all of those. You know, sometimes, you know, I guess as an example, if you have some kind of simulation of a car driving down a road, you might not want to use Wave because it's instead you might want to use Wave RT just because it's faster. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you have a very complicated simulation running there anyway. And if you're actually modeling a car driving down the road, then you might be, you might have simulations which in real time are fairly long, like, you know, the time it takes to, to, to go from start to, you know, highway speed or something, or, or even drive around a track or something. So, mm -hmm. yeah, for that, you definitely need, you definitely need to have, you may need to have some faster parts for some of it. You may not want to mm -hmm. have too much detailed simulations for parts of it. Mm -hmm. I don't, know if, the, I don't yeah. know if the same thing's true with turbo machines or not. I imagine it is to some extent. It is to some extent. I mean, modeling a whole compressor or turbine is very common. Uh, 
modeling oil gas turbine, which is the you know compressor combustor turbine, not not so common. I have seen analysis where they, they do the whole business. Uh, at that point, I think it's almost more of a stunt than than it is a useful engineering exercise. But it is just kind of really, scary. yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely right. Usually, because you might have you know again just to when you get to this level of detail, just you know the guy who runs a turbo machinery CFD and analysis like Mark and I are not the same people who are going to run a, a simulation on combustion usually that have its own people who have probably spent their whole life just knowing how to model how to design combustion how to design a combustion chamber so what matters for us is really what they can deliver downstream in terms of pressure and temperature because we're going to use that to design the turbine but we don't actually know what's going on there just like just tell me the flow the temperature and the pressure maybe the swirl if you already have that information otherwise um, yeah right I guess that's it. Yeah. yeah that's good. It all depends how big a system you you want to model simultaneously. I did some work years ago on um, aircraft emissions, right? And uh, that was fascinating work because um, you had people who specialized in you know just in the combustor, thousands of a second, right? In the formation of these nitrogen sulfur compounds. Then you had the flow through the turbine, which not many people looked at in terms of evolution of the pollutants and so on. It's like maybe a second to go through there. And then it kind of goes out the back of the engine and, and it forms like a jet. And that's you know, a few seconds there. And then it rolls up with the aircraft and that's that can take, uh, you know, that goes on for miles, right? If you ever look up in the sky and, and see an airplane and see that white plume. Yeah. Yeah, for like six, seven miles. So, and then, um, and we modeled that, you know, and which is a different scale to model CFD. It's not very usual to model it on the, the miles long scale. Mm -hmm. But then people took it from there and they 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 modeled the, the whole damn earth and, and where are these pollutants <laughs> dispersed and, and uh, how they would dissipate in the atmosphere. So yeah, I thought I, I never forgot that experience and the disparity in time and uh length scale that people could work with depending on what you were what you were looking at. Yeah. And again, there, it's so specific that really takes a different level of skills to solve each one of those problems, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, obviously there's a boundary and intersection between them. So uh, sometimes you can kind of solve them in isolation, but um, usually you don't need to solve the whole thing in entirety, but you do have to make sure that when you pass it off from one either system or analysis to another, you do, you do, you make the right hand off. Yeah, that's usually where mistakes happen, right? Um, <laughs> people do their job right. The person in the next cube's doing their job right, but you're not yeah, doing the right thing together. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And speaking of which, why this whole thing of putting us together and using the software in combination? So for someone who doesn't know what tubo charging is, basically, you can go through the. I guess we all worked or heard about Nick Baines is a kind of a guru in terms of this turbocharging word. Basically, you can go through his book and it's, it's, it's very simple. You can get that actually the bigger the pressure, the inlet of your combustion engine, uh, internal combustion engine, the more power and torque, usually efficiency is where we can get. How to deliver that? Back then, people were using uh, superchargers first. So the actual engine will drive the compressor. Um, there are actually a lot of uses for that and a lot of uh, good things of that. But the thing is, you're actually taking energy out of the engine. So ideally, that's not as good. What would be good is to release the hot gases that we're delivering out in the exhaust system to actually drive a turbine, and that turbine drives the compressor. Great idea. It's very similar to what actually a turbo pump does because you, you got to a level that is hard to find something to drive that compressor. So much torque and power. So but the problem is you got a little bit of a chicken of the egg problem there because we can design a turbine, we can design a compressor. We don't, when we actually design them, we don't actually know the different speeds they're going to be operating. We can kind of have an idea, but in the end, what actually tells, what actually rules the turbo machinery performance is the system, is what the system delivers in terms of energy to the turbine to drive the compressor and et cetera, so far, so on. 
And that's where, at least from our perspective, when working with Mark and with some of the customers we used to have, it's a little bit of blind. We try to make our best in terms of the compressor design and the turbine design, but we don't actually know if they are a good match until you go back and forth with the engine. So we used to have some very simple models to emulate what the engine would do, but it's, uh, it's a little bit what we said before. Sometimes too simple is not doing any good at all because when you go to the real engine, there's just not, nothing to do with that. So that's why it made sense to use these models in combination. Usually it's a different skill set to use, you know, the Ricardo tools and our tools, but we are kind of laying out a system, an idea of how to work these two tools together and how they can really help to uh, develop new engines, improve existing engines, uh, change a turbocharger and hopefully use the same engine and, it's, and things like that. I, Any I think, comments on that? I think that's the idea, right? I, I think one of the benefits of having the turbine in there is that uh, when you have a piston, it's uh, difficult to make it so that you know, when the exhaust valve opens, the, piston, the gas in the piston is always fully expanded. But when you have a turbine, it's always fully expanded, right? Because the uh, gases exiting exiting the turbine are always at close to ambient pressure. So mm -hmm. that's a, I think that's a big part of the advantage you get of using a turbocharger instead of just having a supercharger. That's instead of just having a, uh, a compressor driven directly off the crankshaft of the engine. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when you when you do have a compressor, you do get some power, some of the energy back because you're you're when you're pressurizing the uh, intake manifold, you're actually increasing the, you know, the, the work of the work that the piston does. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're yeah. both, uh, you know, the engine and the turbocharger system are they're both yeah. pretty pretty complicated, right? And uh, it's not just a, it it's almost a, you know even more complicated still because even if you're just solving for one point or one flow or one speed, um, you know, it's a bit of a challenge, but in, to design a, a turbocharger or an engine system properly, you got to look at the performance over a whole range of, of different uh, conditions and, and different situations and which can be very different from one, one place to another, right? That, that engine has to work whether you're driving in, Death Valley or, or you know, Lhasa Tibet, so. And not, only I, that, not only that, the engine has to be able to run when it's idling. It has to be able to start easily, start properly. You can, you don't want to have conditions where the turbo overspeeds or where the turbine overheats or where the, where the compressor surges. I, my hat's really off to these guys who actually do all this design and calibration of engines because it seems to work very well. And then you vehicle, you know, you know, in the vehicles that are out there. But it's a pretty complicated business. And the engines, you know, I mean, they're very unsteady and this is transients and in any kind of vehicle on the road, transient conditions are really important. You know, I, I, I don't know that much about aviation, but I would imagine that most of the time, you know, all those turbines and compressors that are running on jet engines and turboprop engines and whatever, most of their time, they're just kind of running at the same at even speed, aren't they? There's that's not what really a whole, yeah. A lot of times that's true, and it's not too difficult to design at one point, but to design at multiple points, then it becomes a challenge to say even what define the goodness of it. I mean, like as a consumer, I would define the goodness of my car as, as part, in part anyway, as to how, yeah, how how little gasoline do I need to to buy <laughs> to put in this thing over <laughs> ten year life of it. Okay. So you got to think in those kind of pretty holistic terms to define the goodness. And if you just look at one point, yeah. might not uh, tell you much of the story. Yeah, but but then it depends, Mark, because then if you want to just say few, yeah, probably you want to drive as a, in a constant speed as much as possible. And for that, you want to optimize for that point in specific. But now, if you are a NASCAR driver, you want to change your speeds all the time. You want to go as fast as possible and then you need to be doing a very narrow turn. So you need to go down and therefore you need the weight of your turbocharger to be very small. Otherwise you have some turbo lag and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a, yeah, it's definitely a, I mean, that's why it is, even though combustion engines are a bit more than a hundred years old, uh, it is, I, I wouldn't tell a major 
industry is still very much evolving, especially now with with the whole mix of hybrids and electrics. Like there is a whole, it's not as mature as think, people was, would think. You know, for some stuff we think like, I've been doing that for so long, we probably haven't figured out. Like, no, 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 there's so much to, to learn still and so much that we're still catching up and still actually applying to the different applications. You yeah, know, when you're talking about hybrid, hybrid electric systems, that's kind of a, sort of what I was thinking about. You know, when, when people want to, if you really want to simulate, simulate a hydro, hybrid electric system, electric system you have to have some kind of overall simulation that has all those models in it and you have to come up with a way to control that which is mm -hmm. you know a pretty horrendous problem i would think and uh that's where these really big simulations come in yeah and decide when to use one or the other yeah it's a very tricky thing yeah yeah cool so yeah that was the theory that was what we would hope to be doing now we and then we went and i yeah again thanks all you guys because it's uh it's hard to do a research paper when you're not in university we all have our actual jobs that pay the bills so doing taking some time aside to do a paper is not that easy but uh, i'm actually pretty happy with the results so part do you want to go through a little bit what we did what is that engine that we started so we we had a lot of back and forth we thought about doing some crazy stuff uh, maybe uh, electric assisted supercharger and stuff like that, which is kind of new. But in the end, we were like, okay, it's getting super complicated. We need to go back and forth a couple of times. So maybe let's get something simpler. That's what we did. So do you want to maybe go through a little bit part of what we did there? It's a big uh, diesel engine. Yes, uh, I think when we when we started this project together uh, we were looking at different engines that we uh, that are already modeled in wave itself and we chose let's start with a truck engine uh, it's a 10 liter engine uh, i6 um, and we and it's a two uh, two turbocharger engine so uh, i think the map uh, that we came up was quite it's quite old i don't know how old that maps were matt do you have any idea uh, when uh, no, when was this I example created yeah was it what yeah it's been yeah the maps uh when was this example created uh, or the, what was the origin of the map do we know I, I i don't really know i just know it's very old yeah it's really really young yeah. i i i, I, I think it worked perfectly for our case yeah let's say, let's put it this and way the, i the company that did the turbocharger doesn't exist anymore uh -huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but That's it worked perfectly fine for our case yeah yeah it does <laughs> I think the reason so, we did switch to the old engine was just that we didn't have any uh, any any you know issues with privacy of data or anything like that. Absolutely. It's so old. That's the main thing, yeah. And actually, that's a good point that you made there, Pat, uh, Matt, because one of the uh, reviewers, and I get it, you know, I I do agree. I guess go into like a, a journal level, we would have to do a little bit more work and maybe have a partner with the test rig or something. But they said, oh, why you guys didn't take something that existed? So you could do an iteration and do testing. Like, do you guys understand what that means? Like actually designing and machining and putting a new turbocharger in place? Like, it's not, like I, I, don't take me wrong. I would love to do that. But that is, a, that's more than four guys. That's a project for like a, a research endeavor, let's say, to do this kind of level of iteration. <laughs> I think you did. You also, I mean, you guys also did a decent job of uh, just showing the potential of using these products together, right? Yeah, that, that was basically the idea. And if someone is hearing this and has a engine at home and would like to redesign the turbocharger, I'm super up for the challenge. I would love to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, part. Go ahead. We do have, I found it, I don't know if it, that's common or it's just my, um, let me share it here so you guys can see what I'm seeing. Um, if that's normal for uh, this kind of big and old diesel engine, but I just can't kind of found this uh, power and torque curve kind of kind of weird, kind of because you know usually you have a, a point of maximum torque and it's not necessarily the the, the point of maximum power. So that, in, in some parts, that kind of made our job easier because usually you design the turbine for one point and the compressor for another point. But uh, in this case, both of them 
coincide. So the power keeps going up and the torque also keeps going up. Is that kind of normal for this kind of big engines? Because I would expect to be seeing something like, where is it? The generic one that I put in here. Yeah, something like this. Like this is the, the generic one that I have in here. Well, one thing is I think, you know, normally if you have an engine that has a variable geometry turbine or a wastegate control, the power and torque curves are going to look very different because usually the power turf curve or the sorry the torque curve is pretty flat on the top because they're mm -hmm. controlling the you know they're they're controlling the uh, uh, they're controlling it to be that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know I I don't know I, I've not looked at the torque curves of too many en turbocharged engines that didn't have any kind of a turbocharger control on them. Mm -hmm. All right, so. Boom. And, ah, and here I have a nice screenshot of how the engine looks like. So that's as Bart just said, is a E6, so six, six, six cylinders in, in line. And these little boxes here are where the compressor and the turbine were. So yeah, from there, Parth sent me all the information. And that's what is really nice about Waves, that you're able to actually get exactly what is the dream for a tubal machinery engineer that is the all the boundary conditions for the different uh, engine speeds. So Bart went there and actually pl plotted to me what is the mass flow and the pressure ratio necessary for the compressor and the pressure and turbine at the inlet of the turbine. And based on that, I started the design, uh, Mark and I started the design of the turbine and the compressor. Actually, no, for this guy, we also had something else that was the existing, um, the existing maps. So the thing is we have a map, but not a geometry. So that's tricky because you don't actually know how that looks like. Usually turbo chargers are, let's say they look the same. So we made some assumptions that are pretty safe assumptions, right, Mark? Yeah, we had to retrofit it and, uh, and kind of do it in reverse, match the, match the map. So uh, it's easy to do that for one point. But uh, we had to twiddle with it a bit to uh, to get a similar map out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And let's put it this way: like, uh, yes, it is a mainline model, so it is a lower level modeling and design. But it's it behaves like it's a surrogate of what a compressor actually behaves like. So yeah, it's not that simple to because basically we need to redesign, but we have no no geometry. So we are literally coming up. We are redesigning just based on the performance and. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a little bit tricky, but yeah, like we got something reasonable. And of course, we made some assumptions on yeah. a specific thing. Really, only a few hours, right? And um, but if you went, if you did that, would try that with CFD, man, you'd be there for a, a month trying to <laughs> try to tweak around that until you got you got something you wanted. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we started from there, and then we were able to yeah have a come up with a geometry. And I, uh, yeah, put some, some of the overall sizes in here. And then we did the same for the turbine where, again, I had the map, I had where the, where the boundary conditions in the map. And now we also had a compressor. So we needed, in, at least for a couple of points, I was able to actually design in a way that would generate that much power, power enough to drive my compressor. But again, we got to the same problem. Does it actually run? Is it good enough? And what we did, we went back and sent that over to Parth. So that's the big catch in here. For well, let's put that to the last example. Then I, I mentioned what I was about to say here. So I we were able to generate a, a performance map with these lower level models. And here they are, if you're looking into the video as well. But um and yeah, the performance was really close. Actually, we got some improvements, but that was not even the intent. The intent actually was to be able to redesign. And you know, if you are in the business of designing turbochargers, you might know that's uh, that's hard. So in theory, now we would have a geometry that we could start and design our own compressor, even though we didn't have any geometric information. So yeah, that was that in itself was pretty interesting, but then we went to the second case study. So Park, if you wanted to go through what we did for the second case study. Yes, so once we established that um, the reverse engineer map from our baseline data or baseline model was fitting well, uh, 
and based on from the map that we were given by the concept and RAC, the next idea was to modify our current baseline model um, that would generate 15% higher torque, more or less. And the way you can do that in, in WAVE is to modify the turbine geometry using the multipliers. So we in WAVE, there's a possibility to modify the diameter multiplier that scales the turbine and that we have efficiency multiplier and the mass flow multipliers. Basically, it just scales the, the, the turbine or compressor depending on what the multiplier you are choosing to. And that's what uh, I did uh, with my baseline model. And we came up with a model that was giving more or less 15% higher torque. And, and again, as uh, Diego mentioned, it's very easy in WAVE to come up with the processing results to generate diff, uh, you know, to acquire different kinds of output. And this new information was supplied back to Diego and they worked on it to come up with a map that would do the same, basically. And, and that's what exactly what we did here, right? So uh, yeah. new information that was, uh, was generated from, from, from our model. Yeah, that's perfect. And, you know, a few caveats there. It is a very common practice in industry to do what we did first part. So first of all, that was, of course, the obvious step. So you, um, you come up with new maps, probably internally, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I'm very confident it might be something using um, the, um, uh, how do you call that? It's not efficiency laws, it's a correlation. No, when you use the non-dimensional numbers to scale the map, uh, affinity loss, that's what I was trying to get. I'm pretty sure it might be something close or a uh, uh, definition of affinity loss that's very much used in the industry, all kinds of tool machineries we do that. It was just one caveat there so that a lot of people don't that forget. Usually it's very easy to come up with these uh, equations that are like, oh, the diameter two in diameter one is, you know, you just multiply based on the different flow rates and things like that. The, actually the way of coming up with those equations is you equal the non-dimensional. So you are, you are assuming both designs have the same Reynolds number, they have the same flow uh, coefficient, the same work coefficient, and that's usually not right. So the very way of when you make one equal to the other, it's wrong. And that's why not always you can scale these maps. It is true if you have like, you know, a compressor map, uh, 30,000 RPM, another one of 40, and you want to scale one in between them. Yeah, that's the perfect way of doing that. But now if you want to scale different designs, uh, I've seen people doing that even with different fluids, it's, it doesn't work like that. You need to know what, you, what you're doing. So it is probably a good first assumption. But yeah, sometimes it amazes me how much people use that and rely so much work on that. But yeah, that's absolutely right. What part did that? I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure that if the design, you know, if the design challenge is simply to make the compressor bigger or smaller or the turbine bigger or smaller anyway. I mean, even if you assume that, uh, you know, scaling something by dimensionless parameters is perfectly accurate. I'm still not sure that's going to get you the right compressor or turbine that you want anyway, because if that was the case, then all compressors and turbines would be the same, just they'd be different size, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know, that's I, absolutely right. That's absolutely so, right. There is, let's put it this way, there's different solutions to come up with the same pressure ratio and flow, but then you might have like a, a speed line that looks like pretty flat and chokes, or you have something that you know looks like this, and all depends on the yeah, blade you design. Don't, you don't want your compressor to you don't want your compressor to start surging. You want to make sure that you can get enough boost of the compressor and at a, exactly. at a speed that you know a speed that your turbine can operate at. Yeah, all that and, kind of stuff. And, and and that what you just described, man, that's absolutely right. Like the surge point, that's not something you have or affinity law. Like we don't know when it's gonna surge. It's gonna surge, especially because actually it depends much more on the system rather than the compressor itself if it's gonna yeah. surge or not. That's true. So, so basically, what we did there, I did. We did use the same non-dimensionals that we used before, and uh, we came up with a new design, very much based on the previous one, but we designed a new compressor. So, not only part, you know scale those designs but we use that as a baseline to now design a new compressor and that's what we did in the paper 
And then we come up with the geometry and I compared how this compressor grew. So it was not like a linear order, like we, this, let's say we needed 30% uh, more uh, boosting power. The compressor didn't become 30% bigger. Maybe it was faster. It was a combination a little bit faster and a little bit bigger, but not just bigger. And, uh, and then with that in mind, with the design that is actually slightly more physical and something that uh, we did and we took into account, you know, the possible thickness and things like that. So it's a model more close to reality. We generated another map and send that over back to Park. And he put that in the new engine and then we were able to match. I think I have the comparison here to case one. The comparison to the baseline. So yeah, we were able to match the extra 15% in most of the engine points. Actually, a couple of them was actually 30% more torque. So it was actually much more than we were expect expecting. And uh, and again, in theory, if we are actually building this compressor, is a, this turbocharger is a very good starting point. And this right. was the end of the story. So I guess that was a that was a very good two examples. And yeah, could really show how these two tools could be very powerful to do this kind of study. I think that basis, the basic methodology could be used for any kind of target that you wanna that you wanna achieve. Absolutely. This, yeah. this is just an example of something that we tried out or that Parth yeah. and that you guys and, tried out. And I mean your software, our software, everything supports Python scripting. So that's this is the process. It's kind of like laying out the algorithm. If someone out there is doing 50 of that during the year, yeah, it's very likely you could uh, optimize and come up with an automatic way to do most of these steps. And the only human part of this would be actually analyzing the maps and just like what is good, what is not, and what you want to improve. Yeah, I mean, there's different approaches you could use too. I mean, you could do the one that you guys did, where you, you know, you you tweak the compressor turbine that you have just to see what kind of what the potential is of the engine to produce more power if you put in different turbochargers. By the way, there's another feature in in Wave that you can use that use for that too. There's uh, these kind of dummy compressor and turbine jun junctions that don't require maps, so. Mm -hmm you know, the compressor junction will try to meet some target boost pressure that you tell it. And the, but besides the point, I mean, another way you could be doing this is you could be actively working on the turbocharger design together with the engine. So you could do a study and say, you know, what happens if I make, say, the wheels a little bit bigger, the wheels bigger on the compressor and turbine, is that going to get me closer to whatever target that I want? So you go ahead mm -hmm. and modify your already calibrated compressor and turbine models in compound and retail. You modify them, create maps, run wave, see what you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Also, something I put some of these ideas, not all of them, but in the in the final part of the of the paper with future work for anyone wants to see that there is a bunch of options also another one we got a customer a couple of years ago when i was working with mark that it was a, a turbo charger oem but they're not doing any new designs basically he wanted a physical way to scale the the maps when you're doing blade trims so basically you have the compressor in your jace just decreasing how big your blade is or you're just doing a diameter trim why people do that because it's very expensive to come up with a whole assembly you know a new volute a new uh, lubricating system and etc and just by kind of tweaking the engine the, the the turbine and the compressor you can kind of shift your design you know you can come up with one what they call the progenitor and you could, could come up with a family of compressors based on you know a combination of trimming the blade and trimming the diameter it's not of course as good as designing a new one but i mean as we know in engineering usually it's not the best solution is the good enough solution that uh, makes it and uh, that makes perfect sense and that is another use so that was a Back, and he had wave as well in house, and that's he wanted our tools to just kind of go back and forth and just make sure he's not doing some crazy assumptions when he's doing like this flow trims, there's a uh, blade trims and diameter trims for the impellers. 
Yeah, I think it, we should emphasize though that um, in the way we approach this, um, you, know, you mentioned uh, the non-dimensionality and the scaling and so on. I mean, that, that does work, but when we applied the mean line method, we had a lot more fidelity in, in, the, in the result. And the time it took to do it really wasn't any, any more. I mean, it's basically blink of the eye. There's a lot more going on there than just the back of the envelope stuff that people are used to. But um, so even though we were able to thrash out a lot of the uncertainty, you know, in terms of the, the human time anyway, really the cost was, was very low. Um, yeah. and computers yeah. are cheap, but, but engineers are expensive. So. Um, the, I, think there's, I think there's a lot the, of benefits benefit to done. keeping the number of uh, parameters that the analyst has to deal with to a minimum, you know, which is what you do yeah. with those codes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So yeah, I'm mindful of time. Thank you very much, guys. I need to record the video now, so it was good to catch up with all of you guys. So basically, now I need to come up with a video, and that will be my defense of the paper for the um, Turbo Expo 2021. And uh, I'll send that over to you guys when it's ready. Uh, yeah. But yeah, thank you very much. I had a lot of fun doing this paper. I really liked the end result. And uh, just like one of the reviewers, maybe it's not useful for uh, research. But I think, I honestly believe it's pretty useful for people doing this kind of work out there. And uh, yeah, it was uh, really nice to put this really heavy weight that is uh, Ricardo in one side and concepts in one side and kind of you know, join the powerful tools into one thing. So uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be that we did this. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't initially understand what this was for. Now I see it's just because it's a virtual conference, right? And you can't actually, so if you can't actually have any discussions there, so you're just doing it here, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I could come up just with a video, but it's kind of like, after so long in this, uh, in this quarantine, uh, I, I wonder if I still have the social skills to talk to people and, you know, <laughs> get out there and, and get feedback and just understand or if I'm just like talking nonsense. So it's, yeah, it's good to have this. Everybody's feelings have gone down. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the yeah. so it's, it's, it's good to still catch up and just like, OK, we are, you know, uh, I still know what we did, why we did and this, you know, some back and forth. So, yeah, I guess. Uh, we're, I'm in a better position now to defend this paper. <laughs> okay. Okay, then. Thank you very much. You guys have a great Easter. Thank you very much for this. This episode also will go to live into my podcast. Thank you very much for agreeing to that. And uh, yeah, I will send it over the video when the defense of the paper is ready. Thank you. All right. okay. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.